Good afternoon from my side. See you all here late afternoon, last session before drinks or whatever we get. <laughs> Let's see. Hopefully something interesting. My name is Margaret Franz. I'm from Siemens Technology, which is the central R&D inside Siemens. My colleague wasn't able to join because of visum problems not arrived in time. He sent his regards. I, I assume he will be watching virtually. I start. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. I want to cover industrial world and uh, industrial world connected to these new kids of the block, blockchains and identities, especially self-sovereign identities. Um, I'll assume that you know what who Siemens is, large German-based international company, 180 years, some hundred thousand employees and so on. Uh, you can look it up. I will not go to in the details or areas details. I uh, will more cover how we use this, why we use it, and what it makes the benefit in the industrial world. So um, we are part of the Project ID Union. It's a German funded project. <laughs> uh, I'll, when you looked up the, my presentation from last Hyperledger the Global Forum, you will see an introduction. I will only cover parts of this here. And we target uh, natural person, legal entities, and things. And the things, not the one side of the things, the hard side of the things, so the industrial things. So um, from ID Union, we managed since last year to bring up our first really major milestone, which is uh, establishment of the non-profit European cooperative. This will be the one um, that our test net, which runs since 2020, um, will be covered. And uh, there, will be, there will be a new one which goes uh, to pilot and to production. And uh, therefore, we want to have the governance organization and an organization which will offer this uh, to the European market. Um, the other is uh, we're working with different other projects uh, uh, in a consortia and other um, being active, uh, like here in um, joining the European Identity Wallet Consortium, that where our focus or one of our focuses is the organizational digital identity. So there are natural persons legal entities, the organizations, and things. So from our use cases, we cover broad range, a lot of use cases using our test nets, as mentioned. And uh, for this talk, it's about industry and IoT. And there you see master data management, I think for the, I should do a laser pointer. So that's better for the people online. Um, so industry IT, what is industry? Legal entities are working together, the supply chains um, buying and at the end, somewhere in the end, we are the end customers as natural person because we buy it <laughs> and uh, have to pay all this. <laughs> and um, we all know that uh, um, a lot buzzwords like uh, IOTs and blockchain, you always have to know what does it mean. And looking at something like um, IOT is most or less a kind of edge device. And an edge device for me is processing information near physical I.O. Whether it's your mobile phone, or your, your physical I.O. or your car or uh, other devices. Um, and there you have some compute power. And it's an, at the end of the day always who has the ownership of what and how is the communication flow and how secure in the industrial world it's more complex because it's not one to one offering. It's a lot of uh, devices which do the work, which generate the money at the end of the day. It's called OT, operational technology. And the IoT is a new kid on the block helping the OT generating money making more uh, efficient, more insights, and so on. You all might uh, be familiar with this, but you have to understand that there are a lot of parties working, a lot of supplier have to be 
in the factory or in other uh, machineries uh, bring together the result. So they come together, work together, and the systems are special configured, have special communication, and so on. So industry is the right side, and industry is not enterprise IT. Enterprise IT is just only IT <laughs> and will reach humans at the end of the day. Here it will be a belt or a controller for something. This is at the end a, a sensor that something happens. So, and every of these products which are running there have a life cycle. It's designed, it's engineered, it's produced, and then it goes to operation. And during the life cycle, there can be a one second or third life because it will, might be resold, and the next one is using it. And after this, it will be decommissioned and recycled. This is the normal life cycle of a uh, product, industrial product, and uh, you will, as consumer, most likely never see the controller in a, in a factory floor or so. So, and uh, nowadays, what's happened, a lot of information technology comes in called IoT in over the OT, helping uh, as said, but also where is this uh, new regulations coming up and other information like European Green Deal, Sustainable Product Initiative, Circular Economy and so on, um, where more information is needed about the device. And some you get out of the specs and some you have to collect during life cycle because your, your, your energy consumption um, in, the, in the floor, uh, whatever you produce, ha you have to measure it, that you know, okay, this was my energy I have produced, that I know that my plant has used this amount of energy, when you just look at energy, or um, the device, what is the footprint of a device? Yeah, and the, and the device is built throughout the supply chain. So, this is um, a changer, uh, an additional changer about how many data do I need to fulfill my task, build something, being compliant, um, and have uh, what data do I need, and which data do I have to share. Because sharing in the supply chain is something which um, companies only do when they are secure that their um, sensitive data, how it is built and so on, are not viewable. So, um, it's easier when you're in a newer plant where you already collect a lot of data, um, where you can um, do all the things and connect and you know how to do it. But industry is also, there's invest, and the invest has to generate money and not cost every day uh, more money. So. And there's life cycle. And the life cycle in industry, if you have um, an energy plant or you have a train or even you own a car, you know it hopefully runs for 10 plus years or so. Yeah? So, and IT always moves in a speed of the light compared to industry uh, development and, and operations. So, um, here you have a lot of challenges and which you have to deal. Yeah, like um, concept on the, um, at uh, IoT, connecting to the OT, get the data out uh, and do something useful, um, generate value, um, but the longevity has to be somehow secured. Then um, since the connection came into every device, what does it mean? how to secure, how to update, uh, uh, so the benefits uh, came with some drawbacks. Yeah? There's connectivity and you have to manage how to do this. Normally you just shield your device that nobody goes out, but something has to be out, especially when you have, gener have to generate new data and it has to be shared. Yeah? How to do this, how to bring this out. Yeah? So up patches, updates, life cycle management, um, then these new legal requirements you have to somehow find your way around this. Um, for instance, for uh, patching, um, the small footprint is about the civil infrastructure platform, which we funded in, uh, together with other uh, partners 2016 about do 
Linux kernel support for more than 10 years. Because when you take classical uh, desktop uh, Linuxes, you get for three to five years. Yeah, so that's what we have to do. And um, let's go to ID Union and the industrial use cases. So the middle pillar I, I uh, addressed at the beginning. And uh, the good and the bad part is um, the devices evolve, get more smart, and IoT is just a smart device, and smart is just a computer in the device, but smart also means more flexible computation, not the classical OT designed to the spot, uh, to the price point, which only does what it is used to. Yeah, so it must be a little bit more. Um, uh, or you have these industrial edges, which does bring new computers in close to the machine and communicate with the machine. Yeah. So the devices have evolved from getting the information about the asset, the device, being more passive, yeah, you have a plate on it, the nameplate, which gets more digital, uh, gets the information from this plate. And in Industry 4.0, the digital twin of the device is called asset administration shell, um, which holds the information of the device that someone who needs it can ask about the device and it will be managed. And uh, this asset administration shell um, is of, can be, it's, it's described in a uh, file how in the, when, when you have the static version, how you use it. Yeah. And when you add now our wonderful verifiable credentials, then you can do a lot more about because, uh, what, which device and how you work with it. So we introduced um, verifiable credentials together to the devices and the digital twin. And when you go to industry 4.0, you see the value chain, which is more or less produce something will be produced, which the next one <laughs> takes to produce something, the next one takes to produce something until it will reach the one who um, is the end customer, might be a company or um, a consumer, end consumer. So when you build, drill this down, you have these, there are these three point fractal about um, there's an operator where something runs, something will be um, produced. And the machine supplier, um, who are the, oper the device manufacturer, the factory operator buys a machine, um, get this component. So and the question is, when you want to have the information about the component which is in the manufacturer, do you know it? Will the provider of the machine will give you the information? And uh, well, because you see something could be improved when this component behaves different um, and the uh, use case was, um, could we have new business models with uh, collaborative condition monitoring of the component in a machine? Yeah, and then you get to the problem that do you know the component supplier in the machine? Will the manufact machine manufacturer give you the information about his supplier? And this is a data sharing which makes a little bit the world different how to reach the point in the supply chain which you want to work with as operator. So um, these, we work with all these um, questions in these associations because at the end of the day when we do something, it ha has to fit to the whole industry. So the, the, the end customer building um, a computer or a car is not interesting. It, he has a lot of suppliers in his plant and, and all the uh, in between, um, only if it, it's interesting and it fits with when the supplier align on one setup. So, so getting the information is, whether it's you as a customer or a supplier, a lot of information you get from the website, product information, um, then you normally ask, I need more hardness of the information. Show me please uh, some credential proofs and so on. And uh, how, and when you still have, the, okay, you, sh you told me you are certified by ABC, can you check it or do you just believe it? Today you just believe it. But with verified credential, you, you could move on to say, okay, these proof of origin, integrity, expiration date, and so on can be all digital managed. Yeah? 
And this is, goes back and forth to see, okay, is the company really the company I'm talking to? Um, is the information really from the company who provides the information to the company I'm talking to? And so on. Um, and we all know that fraud is out there and supply chain will do a lot to find out whether this payment is right to the right company and so on. And uh, you can bring more hardness in this information, more verification in uh, when you use um, uh, the verifiable credential uh, and identity approach. So, if you had this triangle with down to the component supplier, where these small little um, colored icons are asset administration shells, so little twin of the device, um, you could do this when you say, okay, I have a connection in the digital twin of information or in the device is information about the manufacturer um, or in the components about the manufacturer that he can, that you have an opportunity to connect to him and do what the use case is. Yeah. So um, when you take um, organizational identities yeah, and you introduce these wallets for the companies and the identities come for companies and we have the you can work on that the component in the machine in the, by the operator um, as a credential from um, the component supplier, which is in the machine. At the beginning, else you wouldn't see what's in the machine. So, and how you could approach this. And what I've done in ID Union is, okay, we have first have to have uh, organizational identities. Yeah, and when you have organizational identities, you can do things like um, connect the, com the customer supplier, so this is a classical peer-to-peer, -peer, and have um, you know, the corporate buyer presenting the, the credential he gets from his company and uh, connect to the supplier and the supplier can say, okay, I know, know you're a, a corporate buyer. I know your company because it's in the credential. I can ask for the public bid because it's in, get more information um, uh, and vice versa that the customer can ask, okay, at the end of the day, you will send me an, um, an invoice and I have to pay, so I have to do everything to do to check what I have to do when I, uh, when I want to onboard you at the beginning, getting a lot of information, bank account and so on. And this we used in the setup, you see in the middle here, um, some companies issuing credentials from the right side to the left side that Commerzbank uh, issues um, a credential to Bosch or to Siemens to see, okay, yes, this is really the organization. So Targent has checked, uh, like an EV certificate, you are, was checked and you get from someone else a, a certificate that you are a company. And when you get from the bank certificate that you are a bank and, 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 yeah, you can say, okay, what do you need to fulfill your needs in terms of legal requirements being uh, compliant and uh, for fraud prevention. Yeah, because nowadays you need a lot of information. Is this child labor in the supply chain or whatever? Um, how to have the information from your supplier or from your customer because you only are allowed to do business um, and have to check um, uh, anti, uh, based on anti-money laundering and so on. Um, who do you make business? And here you have now an automated way to get all this information to say, okay, I, I know you, the customer knows the supplier, the supplier knows the customer and can check how the relation is um, between the bank account and the organization, yeah? or the VAT number, or the global location number. And uh, it's something more than just nowadays a lot of filling out Excel sheets or printing out uh, something, having a PDF. And this can be automated. What we have shown uh, in this uh, Interop plug fest, these companies came out together, um, supplied this, and uh, so the, the largest uh, uh, demo was a B2B online checkout, clicking and by clicking uh, the QR code, he connects to the supplier. The supplier asks the company of, of the purchaser 
and back and forth. And then when you say, okay, I have, have all the information I need to do the business, I can put it to my internal IT, which we all have, to say, yes, it will be shipped to you. Yeah, because I now know how to send the invoice for and, and uh, you know which you're dealing and all your other requirements you have uh, for making business with me is okay. So we have the organizational part. Then it's about humans. Yeah, how to connect. And as I said, there is this asset administration shell as digital twin which you can look in what uh, is the information, so-called so sub-models, which describe this uh, information about the device. And there uh, you can look at it with the software on the right side, the ASX server, which will display it. And nowadays, you'd, this, the setup which is existent is there's an OpenID Connect server and the CAs and so on. But if you add the credential of um, an employee of, a, of the customer yeah, who can connect there. Or for the manufacturer that you don't, don't allow just whole Siemens to um, connect to the machine, but uh, someone who can prove that he is from Siemens and only these five or, or 20 people. Yeah. So just do the magic with accessing this by having your credential simple with your email address in the wallet, which says, okay, I'm from Siemens, and I want to log in. Then uh, it interops with OpenID, gets a token, and I can access. Um, so this would be the human part which is going in. And then the next thing was, hmm, what do we do when we know the human part? But the industrial part is a little bit more difficult. Yeah? Because the devices are shielded, as I said, are an environment, they can't just watch as a QR code for initiate uh, a connection. Uh, they, in the factory floor, you find a lot of different um, bus systems. Where do you want to um, kick in with this all? And what we had tried out was um, smart devices. Um, how can we um, come in, um, do this, that authorization can be done from the device to the company and to people and to other devices. So from device to device. Uh, the paper should be out. Uh, when I painted this last week, um, it was not, not, not online. It, it will come because it's uh, <laughs> a conference which is yesterday starts for the week uh, in, in Midweida. Uh, but um, Maybe I update it when, when, when I have the right link. This is now the link to the conference page. So, and we made this in a project called RailChain, so a side project, where we tried, okay, let's do this on a real device, on a real big, long device, which has a lot of components in it, um, get to the information. And because uh, Deutsche Bahn um, operating these devices, um, I uh, said, okay, when I could have this, what could I do? Yeah. I know that this device is really from the manufacturer, Siemens or whatever, and uh, because I can ask the device. Yeah, so it's not a fake device, uh, and there was some fraud in between. It's really, I can ask it. So it only would, they would have to have the, um, the key material to bring it in, um, that our device is, is really 100% faked. Yeah? So a lot more, um, you find a lot of um, rebuilt devices out there in the market, and this would be an approach when all the other I mean, uh, supplier also align on this, that you can have, okay, this is one set I can see from the door element to the HVAC to the whatever, to the whole train, that is really from the supplier. So um, the other is you, when you, collect the information about um, the system. You can have the asset description from the business, from the technology, from the runtime information to the next point that you have the information over the lifetime of the asset when you sell the small part or the large part to the next one and give the next buyer the information this has happened to the device and I can prove it. So um, starting with Yes, we exchange at the beginning our identities between supplier and uh, like I showed, 
and the uh, customer. Checking this with the internal IT, yeah, um, everything's in, the additional information is, uh, we now have the did, did um, um, information, so the did document and all this, and know how, how we can connect to this. And then um, he buys, Deutsche Bahn buys a, ma a machine from us, yeah, a component or a train. Yeah, so and in the component already is technology, which is in the, described in the paper. It's, uh, uh, to make it small, it just uses uh, DITCOM and basic messages yeah, that we don't have to go to the ledger because the owner, the manufacturer, is known. It's, it's, it's trusted because it goes in at the beginning. Yeah. So, and then Dodger Ban would say, okay, I, I bought the device. Um, now I want to be the owner. Uh, the device said, okay, I don't know you. <laughs> I only hear of, uh, of my current owner. So it will ask us, okay, is this okay? We will, we will say, okay, yes, we know or all paper or IT um, says uh, you have uh, bought it. Yes, please check whether Deutsche Bahn can talk to you the uh, uh, credential way and uh, take a new credential and uh, put in the new owner. So this was then we're going a step down or will we delete it, uh, has to be implemented the way that there is no a new owner of the device. And with this ownership comes that now you can do a lot more. Example was maintenance. So um, the maintenance uh, company which uh, does the um, maintenance at the devices now can get a credential that they allowed in this day to do this or that to that device or this region of devices and so on. And uh, you can have this that your door or your plant will be opened. You can go in if you can prove or you come to the device. They all will ask you, who are you? <laughs> I will not open the door and you I will not open the screen for the engineering, changing the engineering param parameter. But if you show me a credential by, signed by my owner, then I open up the screen and you can change the engineering parameter also. Yeah? And then at the end, the um, maintenance partner should um, issue a credential what is, has happened. Yeah, currently you write down a lot. So you can collect all this over time to have this um, um, audit trail of information of your device. So your digital twin will be enriched and whether it's in the device or it's connected to the device and runs uh, nearby or in the cloud, this implementation detail, how you do this. And so this was a proof of concept which is going to be done. And um, it was done on real devices. Yeah. So they have a advanced train lab. <laughs> this is a a, a train, an old ICE train, um, which is allowed to drive. Yeah, you have to, have to be careful not to lose your drive permit. So you, you can't do only special things. Um, uh, we have done this there. We showed this last year at the Digital Rail Convention and uh, the week before last week, uh, driving around and in Berlin um, and show this to the public um, and the press and so on, uh, presenting or two use cases, the one I just showed you, asset identity and tracking. And the other use case was um, replacing the back block blocks by a blockchain, which is distributed over the train, a local blockchain. Yeah, so that you only not, not only have one um, uh, juridical recorder, you have some copies of it. And if an incident is, will the whole train be destroyed, then uh, or as are there at least one copy free? And um, during night or stop, you could copy it out. And um, uh, so we tested this uh, with real um, access to the bus system. So the old one has an MVB bus, the newer one has Profibus, um, where you get the information which is currently recorded and you can record more the information that the current recorder records. And the current recorder which uh, was the one here, um, down here, um, uh, is, is a harsh environment. 
um, device, but in future uh, system architectures, you will have more and more computing power, uh, like Olnix and, so, and so on. They're working on that you can say, okay, if I have space, I can just put it in and collect the information. And uh, because of a lot of suppliers which go in such a device, yeah, the big one, yeah, now, you, now you have one piece of truth <laughs> where you say, okay, um, I know what has happened there because the recording has done. So, this was a summary of um, Hyperledger in the end blockchain on track, is on track, <laughs> was on track, runs on tracks, because you see the next stop will be uh, the next week and or the week after at Innotrans, uh, the big fair in Berlin, where the, the train will uh, run again. And uh, these two use cases I showed you uh, will, will be there. And um, the other is um, ID Union working on this stuff. We have from tax office to healthcare, this was the box there. So we could elaborate about all this, but this would be some hours more. And um, I think your schedule is not so that we can do this. Um, yeah, Arias, which we tried out, how to get it as small as possible. Um, is, is doable, so the Raspberry Pi's um, um, power would be enough, yeah, um, depending, so it, it's, it's about how the new devices has to be developed and how much uh, resources you will have in there. Yeah, uh, for industrial companies, you have now a, a new option to secure information, to do business and select which business you want to share or have to share on this way throughout the value chain and throughout the value chain. Um, tomorrow, Andreas Kind will give this more information about doing this for um, CO2 information of devices because you have to all um, collect these, yeah, have your bomb list, um, uh, find out which uh, uh, CO2 footprint your component really has to give it to the next customer which needed for the next customer in the supply chain. Have a look there. And I think we have seven minutes for question because thank you for your attention. This was one deep dive or no, it was a high level flying. <laughs> we were not down to crypto and not of the bus system. Uh, of industrial stuff, yeah, but uh, the main message is IoT and industrial IoT are totally different things because on the one side is when your Netflix doesn't run, how much money does we're talking about and get you something back. When the factory can't produce, we will be in a big trouble when we are one of the supplier, yeah, so because it generates money, a lot of money. And it has to, and it's good. Yeah, but this is uh, with a life cycle. Um, you have to solve all these challenges I brought up. Uh, a little bit different life, um, and uh, the magic is how to survive the IT life cycle. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Um, well, it's a verifiable credential, and it's the system which we uh, set up was there's already an invitation link in the device that he can connect to us. Yeah, so the, this, we have to overcome this first connection. Yeah, how you that the device which is somewhere in the world will be switched on, <laughs> and the owner can decide whether it's allowed in the onboarding phase uh, to go to the internet, yeah, or use it when it would be like the old device using, yeah. Uh, with the new stuff, it would say, okay, I want to take over the ownership, yeah. So he has to ask, okay, um, not everyone who switches on will have to get the ownership, <laughs> yeah. It's about um, how to reboot this. And then, um, this was on the, uh, or you can read it afterwards when it's out on the right side, where you see that, uh, uh, 
The first is you have to go to the ledger once, um, but after this you can do all peer-to-peer -peer from device to device because you know, okay, if it's, there's a credential coming in um, and it's signed by the owner, I'm believing this and do the connection or open something or whatever is in there. Um, uh, because you don't want to go to the ledger. At the end of the day, when we read of industrial and uh, read of, uh, uh, speak of devices, we speak of massive scale. Yeah? It's not just 7 billion people and all the classical customer IoT devices, there are a lot of devices. Yeah? And you will not cover this with connecting this to the ledger, especially not when it's not allowed because it's, it's sealed environments. Yeah? So, um, how to to manage this? Yeah. So, yeah, could you have it would one way to overcome that need to connect to the ledger online would be to include a cache at time of manufacture of the ledger? Would that be one way to get around that? You, yeah, you can do a lot with, with caching. So when you say, okay, your uh, uh, digital twin is more in a in kind of um, where well, I have it. I had it on somewhere yeah, here. If you go more to um, caching um, uh, that you have the information regularly updated or so, yeah, then you can do this to say how much of the existing um, areas in the setup you want to have, how to connect there, and how much do you want to do? Okay, I only have partly because my owner will not change his did. Yeah, um, uh, and how is um, the connection to the other devices? It might be from other manufacturer. Yeah, so I don't want to know that the other device from other manufacturer. Um, uh, I just want to know if the ownership of the other device and I'm my my device have this now the new both the same owner. Yeah, then they are allowed to talk. Yeah, so it's only the the owner and uh, more the device doesn't have to know, but the device don't have an own will. You have to program the will, what is allowed to do. Yeah, this is, um, or a policy or however you call it, um, because it doesn't, it will not take out the mobile phone and point to a QR code. Yeah, everything what's happening, you have to be in there or can be added. And here, the owner can add everything, but the interpretation of what is added has to be programmed. I think the second question? Yeah. Um, this is uh, it's all based on Aria and Bindi and it's it's all very nice, but you mentioned a few components along the way that are crucial for this to work. For instance, that What's asset that asset administration shell, what's the standing of those software components? Uh, so Siemens, uh, internal uh, this, this 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 is uh, industry 4.0. Yeah, you can go to Japan or so. Um, it, it's it's come. You don't have to. This is just one uh, digital twin approach. Yeah. So in uh, manufacturing industry, as an administration shell uh, can be used, but you can use it also without any um, as an administration shells. Yeah. It's just about where do you have and hold this information. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 it's a specification out of Industry 4.0. Okay. And there are implementations like this, uh, what I showed you, oh, is it here on the, on, on the, no, here, on the bottom, this uh, SNSation Shell yeah. Explorer here. Um, this is a piece of software, it's open source. Um, um, there's a lot of links uh, in the footnotes where you can look it up. Um, and the, out of uh, Industry 4.0, the Industrial Digital Twin Organization was built, association was built, and uh, there um, you can, you find th there's one link for the video for accessing uh, here with the, with the credential of the email to a running uh, as an uh, administration shell explorer. Yeah, so this is, there's open source out there, and um, the specifications are also out there. It's not a Siemens product also. Yeah, the, what, I, what I mentioned, we work in associations because um, we all meet others and competitors on the same environment at customer side. And 
customers will not just take Siemens, although we would like it. <laughs> Any additional questions or time for? Yes, one more. <laughs> so one last. Siemens seems similar to Goliath. Would you say they're different? They are different, so uh, we're working together with Glyph and with BCGov and so on. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is um, uh, Glyph came out of the financial industry uh, because of fraud and so on. And uh, yes, uh, like I mentioned with the use case uh, for organizational IDs, um, where, how much organizational IDs can you get um, for um, who has what? And uh, what uh, we are striving is, at the end, there must be uh, interoperability of these. Um, also, in, in the uh, first slide I had with the European Union uh, organization ID, which will come out the IDAS2 um, regulation, but as international company, there's Europe and there's the world. You have, what is the uh, right approach? How much letters in these do you need uh, worldwide? Um, at least three or so, <laughs> uh, Japan, Americas, Europe or so. And um, um, how will you, the Glyph is working on this verifiable line numbers, yeah, which you'll find online from them, which uh, they use carry for this. And we use uh, uh, Hyperledger Indy and, we, and they, we're working with them how to interop. Um, so all this is technology and at the end of the day here, you only, uh, we're working on an identity ecosystem. This means, okay, it has to go and to interop first with these 99.999% brownfield out, this, out there, yeah. <laughs> the world as it is, because you, you will not start with new one. It has to fit to existing like this or, uh, OICD stuff and so on. Uh, and uh, Glyph, um, which org ID you need depends on what the customer belief you have to have. Uh, it's like the payment in a shop. When your beloved payment system is not mentioned, <laughs> then you can't buy something, yeah? yeah? If there's only PayPal and X and Y, but you want this bank X and he don't do uh, this offer to pay. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's at the end of the day, it comes out, what will be the European regulation be? Yeah, having an, uh, identity of all legal entities in Europe that you know, okay, this Spanish or Polish or German uh, institute, um, special legal entities are not covered with all the registers out there. Although we have uh, in our project also the German Bundesanzeiger, which issues the Handelsregister Auszüge. Um, so for the larger companies, but then we have the transparency registry, but what is the register, where is the uh, a town registered, yeah, or a doctor, and so on. So we, we, we have the uh, German printing ID company, we have all banks in Germany because <laughs> we have the different, the organization, um, Bank Verlag and um, Finanzgruppe, um, uh, der Stadtsparkassen und Genossenschaftenbanken. Um, so, um, because, um, and last year, the regulation of the German ID was, a, um, uh, uh, changed and the anti-money laundry that in the future you can do stuff with the smart EID, which is a copy of your German physical card in the, in the wallet in your uh, smartphone. Yeah, and there it starts. When you have this, you can go to Procura, list it in some registry to say, okay, this is really the company and, 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 and. So therefore, it starts with the human setting up a, com uh, a company because um, corporation acts throughout humans. Yeah. So it's, it's from the bootstrapping and you can have uh, credentials uh, for governmental use cases, but the larger part will not be um, either su substantial or high. Yeah. Um, you will have use cases, like I said, and when you want to do this uh, outside Europe, yeah, how to manage this, you, you need one approach, and then different ledgers, how the wallets will, will behave. And when you see that the, the, the Lissy agent, uh, so the smartphone wallet already checks whether there might be a new proof that there is an QWAX or an, uh, um, an EV certificate of 
for the domain, gives them more hardness for the initial connection and so on. Yeah, so it's a lot of, of work with. Yeah, just, to, just to set this uh, a bit uh, in, a, in another context, the German EIP stuff has nothing to do with SSI. <laughs> So what we all need is one base layer of technology which can work together. And this is what we're working on. Yeah? And whether you need, the customer will ask for Glyph or the cost for um, a D-Trust or a Targon's um, org ID, as long as, okay, there's a credential with this schema and you believe this is an org ID. Yeah? There's, there will be the presentation. My impression was that ID union is a decidedly German federal project. I've been a fan for a while, but yeah, it's 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 a German project. Um, we were going European with our uh, cooperation uh, uh, cooperative, and uh, there will be the large scale pilot next year um, for uh, wallets. And uh, we are a part of the uh, consortium which submitted uh, for this uh, uh, large-scale pilot. And there you see all the, the uh, different member states which are uh, in this uh, consortia. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the European legislation has to come and then the Implementation Act has uh, to do something. So um, for the European level, I think you will need uh, three to five years. The thing is, ID Union is a project. You are absolutely right. It started off as a federal ministry of economic affairs funded project. It's still. It is still. It is still. It will run for three years in the end. We have crossed, the, I think, the half line we have crossed now. And obviously, everyone in this big round and people interested are very much interested in continuing the great work out of this project. That's the reason why the a European cooperative was founded to not have it limited to a German uh, project and, and development approach, but open it for a broader audience. So the cooperation, has, uh, the cooperative has been founded to in, in encompass EU member states, Norway, Switzerland, and the UK. So everyone in this realm could potentially become a partner of the European cooperative. The cooperative was founded with three company members now, and we are planning to open it up to bigger rounds. So, um, so it's Siemens and Esatos and a couple of others will be well, in the first batch to basically widen <laughs> the group. Yeah, so it's, it's, it, it's open, it's non-profit. Uh, you can't be a member. Um, you have to check the details whether it makes sense for you or not. But at the end, um, there is something needed how to bring this to the next stage. Yeah. We, we started this with the, at the beginning that not, oh, let's do a three-year research project having fun with technology and then put it in the drawer and put it in. You can't imagine how much legal stuff <laughs> and work has to be done. And we have uh, two uh, smaller companies of Germany and one Austrian company because we have at least two member states to just start it. Yeah, all the, the legal administration stuff, uh, getting an account, and uh, we are close to getting in the registry. And, yeah. and the European cooperative is something that is fairly new. It has been around for quite a while, but not so many organizations have chosen this, this uh, legal entity option. So not everyone is familiar with that now. So even including lawyers, banks, and so on. So if you want to do all the regulation right, you have to find the right people to get it done. But it's now the first stage has, has been done, and now it's basically uh, when we have uh, created this nucleus completely, we will round it up and, and open it for, for everyone. So I 
definitely think this is a great idea and I expect that lots of organizations throughout Europe and the other three countries will be interested to join IDA. Uh -huh. In disclaimer, I have a role in following how ESI is developing and the European blockchain services infrastructure and I'm, I'm not fully convinced that, that it won't get much further I mean, I mean, than that. Okay, well, let's see. That's, that's good. <laughs> We are fine with this because I um, hope it's really cool. But we also have people who work in EPSI and um, so they have different meaning. <laughs> I think EPSI was more driven out of, of political uh, decisions yeah. and ID Union is basically a European option for operating a, a, a trusted uh, a network for SI implementation. Yeah. So that's kind of the, uh, the idea and we have lots of um, heavyweight organizations in the pipeline to be members of our union and making it happen. So I'm, I'm fairly confident. We are a very small organization, but Siemens and others uh, are a large scale organization taking it forward. Yeah. Yeah. So then, last question. <laughs> Company and what was it? Employees and the company. Yep. Because the employees are the persons that access the information. Yeah, so this was um, one is who can act on behalf of a company. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. this would be uh, um, a credential for the CEO's procurer or whatever. Power of attorney. Yeah, power of attorney. And the other is what I had in do, 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 where is it? the use case here. Um, that you have not, he's just, this is my Siemens badge. It's about, I can prove that I'm a Siemens employee and I'm a buyer or so, yeah? So, or out of the, the supply chain department, that I can click on here, this web shop, and the system starts, yeah? So, you have the first connection, and based on my credential, the supplier can... Um, connect to the, DI, to the DID information, the DID document of my company. And then they can um, send uh, credentials back and forth, whatever it's needed. Okay, and now for the question. Uh, do you think the solution for the device relationship is also applicable to the, the relationship company employee? It's, it's, uh, I just haven't mentioned it because it's, it's doable. We have shown this, uh, um, that it's, it's doable. Yeah, um, here the talk was more on how to the next step. Yeah, so company and, uh, so company and uh, natural persons, um, you could have a lot of credentials in your wallet from your sports club uh, <laughs> uh, to your company. It's just another relation where you get, okay, um, yes, I'm a member of the sport club, but I'm an employee of, of uh, my company. Uh, and then it's dependent on what should be in there, whether it's, uh, you get some um, uh, money left in uh, your gym because you're a member or uh, which information and for which credential you want to use and you get from your company. Yeah. So you could take this to say, okay, I now have the information and uh, or have several uh, credentials for my employee, for my, my company to say, okay, one badge is, one credential is just for entering the compound or so, yeah, or the, uh, the building. The other is for um, special uh, credentials for these buyers. Whatever you, you, a large corporation is consists of a lot of companies, yeah, like uh, when I mentioned here, when you, when you look at the, the Siemens on the device uh, at the, the side of the door for setting up this, this room, yeah, this is Siemens building technology, which is headed in uh, Switzerland, yeah, which is a Siemens part. Yeah, so Siemens has industry, Siemens has uh, civil infrastructures, um, and uh, Siemens has uh, 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 mobility, yeah? so the, the train stuff and so on. Yeah? So this, 
And internationally, you always have a lot of, and, and even in the internal money flow, and uh, when you look in uh, what your treasury, um, your internal system do, uh, checks throughout the different parts of the company, you can automate a lot. And yes, this is all done because fraud is here. Yeah, look how ABB has lost a lot of money <laughs> For, for the finance guy in, in, in Asia and so on. Yeah. So there's the invoice coming in and the checks on do I really pay it. When this would be in place, I think at the beginning, you, you could do a, I think 80% of the fraud with Corona wasn't be uh, doable. Yeah. Because you can say, okay, this is a company and this is a bank account of the company. Yeah. A lot what you can check, yeah? Okay, there will be others who will try to find out what's the flaw in this system. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> but at least it is, looks like it will be a lot better than what we have currently. And that's what it's all about. It will not solve hunger or peace or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good, uh, from my point of view, and this is what I'm, wor I'm working there, is. Uh, a good step in the next direction. And here it was, I was just the, the, the web shop. Yeah, it was semi-automated. At the end of the day, you can automate it. But to show this, you have to see, okay, there's really the credential coming in and uh, it's shown from the buyer. And yes, uh, uh, the bank account and which was the, which was the um, issuer of the bank account credential. Yeah, this was really Commerzbank yeah, or another bank, bank and so yeah, And you can look it up in the ledger. And if you say, okay, they have to have a Glyph uh, credential uh, or information in the DIT document, or you can ask the bank for a Glyph, yeah, then it all comes together to say, okay, I can now start, depending on my needs, what I want to check to be on the secure way, because as written, compliance and fraud prevention. Thank you, and I um, will be there upstairs. Uh, <laughs>